Okay. Good day, good day. It's a, a lovely day. A lovely day, I think. Um, today we are interviewing Will. He's the owner of DMG Masonry. Uh, they say Adam and Eve were made from the dust. Well, I'm pretty sure this guy was made from the bricks. How's it going there, Will? Pretty good, Mike. Thanks for having me. Hey, no, absolutely. Um, so uh, before we get going there, I'd just like to talk about our surprise sponsor. Uh, her name is Angela. She owns uh, Angela's Artisan Olives and... Uh, Here's a little card she gave me here, kind of cool. Um, you can get, uh, you can see her on um, Instagram. She's the Olive Lady underscore YYC. You can get her on Facebook, Angela's Olives, and uh, Twitter at Angela's Olives. Now, uh, you can't buy from her directly, but she does have some suppliers, and um, uh, some of their names here is uh, Community Natural Food Stores. Uh, she's uh, also selling them at uh, Blush Lane Organic Markets, Springbank Cheese Shops. Sofrito Oil and Vinegar Stores, Say Cheese, Luke's European Meats, um, the Gasoline Farmer's Market in Red Deer and soon in Millerville, uh, Farmer's Market and uh, Bear Spa Farmer's Market, also Fresh and Local Kitchens and Market. So uh, yeah, if you're looking for these uh, amazing olives, check it out. You know, uh, the interesting thing is that I don't even really like olives, but I like these olives. They are so good. Um, I'm going to do a little mukbang for you guys today. Um, so I'm going to do with chopsticks, uh, a little fun fact with chopsticks, uh, in, uh, Japan, you're supposed to use the, the back end of your chopstick, pull it out, put it on a plate, then use the other side for the eating. Just some little fun there with, uh, with these olives. So, um, yeah, this olive here, it's like, uh, she calls it the Cadillac. It's got this nice, like, you know, cheesy, like, I don't know, some kind of like a uh, marinade. And then inside it's stuffed with, uh, uh, an almond so so good i mean mm. they look delicious mm. from here mm. i can right? almost smell them <laughs> so good um um i was talking to angela about this and uh you, know, you can uh, dig in there will if you like um yeah sure Try them. but uh yeah she's uh she's pretty picky about everything where she sources them from and how she uh gets it all done in the uh, kitchen um her menu here is uh, pretty, pretty big. She's got the uh, the blue cheese. Uh, it's a green silicon olive stuffed with feta, marinated in a blue cheese dressing. Uh, she's got the margarita. Um, one's called the dilemma. Uh, man, she's got like, I think she's got like 15 different ones here. Uh, the fire alarm. I might want to try that one out. It's uh, pimento stuffed olives marinated in a hot pepper sauce with jalapenos. So, very cool. Uh, so. Uh, Big shout Delicious. out to, yeah, oh, I love it, eh? Nice. Yeah, I think everyone would like these if you're an olive fan, or maybe not. I mean, you still might like them. <laughs> I'm a man who, who loves his olives, and that's a really good olive. Did it have, I think it had a little peanut in the center, too. Uh, it's a uh, an almond. An almond. Yeah. Delicious. Oh, I know. Um, so, Will, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about what you do? Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a mason, so... For a lot of people that don't know that, uh, masonry is when you combine two materials using mortar. Um, so it could be anywhere from tile, brick, stone, um, block. There's all kinds of uh, masonry units we use to hmm. to build things. Interesting. and um, Kind of a dying trade. Is it? Oh, yeah. Why, why do you say that? Uh, not a lot of people getting into it these days. Um, I mean, there are some bricklayers getting into the trade mm. but as far as masons go like stone masons uh full bed masonry there's really not a lot mm. 
you know, I think the problem that trades these days is that everybody goes to school and they want to be an astronaut, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, it's a dirty trade. It's a very laborious <laughs> trade. Right. Um, so bricklayers are different from masons. Is that what you're saying? Well, brick uh, bricklayers, it's a category of masonry, just okay. like tile setters are. You can have stone masons. Um, mm. But to be a mason, I mean, you really, you do it all. I got gotcha. you. Um, so you brought up the stone masons. What do you, what do you think of that? Not too deep. Um, <laughs> well, I, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I built, you, you know, a structure and homes and I think they built society. They structure it. And I think that's why the term comes from. Really? Yeah, I believe so. I could be mm. wrong. Don't quote me on that. Okay. Well, that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just always want to know what a mason thinks of the stone masons. Well, you know, <laughs> why not? Right. Um, okay. And, um, so, so what is your special specialization in masonry exactly? Uh, we mainly specialize in full bed masonry, but we generally take on any any form of masonry. Hmm. Okay. So full bed meaning hmm. like the masonry units are you know five inches thick. You bring me a piece of stone, like a raw piece of stone. I pitch it into a little block or square, and then you know start to lay. The wall that way. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what would you say the most common call you get for in masonry? In masonry would be, it depends if it's for a new structure, it would be for the bottom half of the house. Um, for restoration, it's again at the bottom of the houses or where the roof meets the chimney. Um, mm. Right. Or the crown of the chimney, typically where water sits. That's, that's mm. usually where I get callbacks from. Gotcha. Um, so you do like the crowns on them too, I'd imagine? Yeah, a crown is, um, so you see your chimney on the outside. A crown, if you have a masonry chimney, a crown can either be like a tin cap going over everything, or it could be a concrete mm. uh, pour that's covering the chimney cap. What do you think is better? Um... Well, it depends on what your style is. I mean, uh, I would say a full slab. So, you know, you can get a piece of limestone, hmm. put it over everything. I'd say that's probably the best way to do it. Really? Okay. Yeah, I, I noticed we see a lot of those uh, concrete crowns and they tend to crack down down them. And I mean, it's really easy maintenance, so you just seal it Very up. Common. Yeah, the typical reason why that happens is, you know... Um, back in those days when the masons were doing it is uh typically you would need some sort of wider mesh or rebar or something to mm. keep that uh concrete together and you know when you're that mm. high up and it's friday at the end of the day uh, you know sometimes you just i'm assuming they would just throw it in you know it would last for you know a good 15 years but if you don't maintenance it it could uh lead to further problems down how, the road. how do you maintenance something like that um typically if uh you should always take a look at your crown every year if you start to notice cracks i would uh call a mason and uh get it dealt with right then and there because you could be looking at you know two-thirds of the cost further down the road if uh, you don't take care of things mm. not to mention we all know uh water's big, big problems in homes. Mm. It could start to uh, damage a lot of things, mm. whatever's underneath it. For sure. Um, so so you're telling me that it's not exactly a DIY kind of thing to, to repair the cracks? No. I mean, well, you know, it, it really depends on how much time and effort and, you know, mm. you want to spend to it. I mean, if you got all the scaffold and tools and knowledge that you you need to do the job, then sure. But if you don't, I would, you know, call an expert. It's kind of like, right. hey, are you going to do the plumbing in your house? Mm, right. Probably not. Yeah, it's, da it's dangerous too. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, um, I mean, just simple things. I, I knew a guy was, um, it, was, it was a few years back, he was cleaning his windows and he fell and died. You know, that's a very common thing with windows. Like we were just out in Bragg Creek and the, the homeowner over the weekend was cleaning his windows, getting them ready to, to sell the house. He fell, uh, dislocated his hip, or I, I don't know. He really hurt himself mm. quite severely. And, I mean, 
I don't know. Was it worth it? Right. Yeah. I, I mean, definitely pass the risk on to professionals. I think, um, definitely. I, I noticed the people that are the most unsafe, uh, are the ones that are like generally the most afraid of heights. Oh yeah. I mean, safety is a, it's a huge, huge concern. And I mean, there's a lot of times where I feel like, you know, sometimes a homeowner will ask me, well, was building all that necessary? I mean, couldn't you just do it off a ladder and, you know, the answer is no, like, you know, our lives are definitely worth that extra step to take to make sure that we all go home mm. at night. For sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think, uh, I mean, some homeowners are very uh, safety, safety conscious and I appreciate those people. Um, but yeah, I mean, you don't want to be scraping somebody up off the concrete. It could be traumatic. I mean, you could, you could, could see it or, you know, um, but just, just in your, on your conscious, like how would you feel? cheaping out on a company that doesn't do safety and then they got hurt. I think that the liability, I mean, I mean, so the moral liability falls on the client a little bit. Oh, definitely. I mean, it, it definitely does. And, uh, I really do appreciate when clients go out of their way to tell me, I really appreciate, you know, the extra steps you took to be clean and be safe. Hmm. Cause it really shows how professional a company is. So, so what, uh, what are those, some of those extra steps that you take? Would you say? Oh, uh, well, it would be, build a proper scaffold, go, you know, uh, a little bit wider or double wide of the chimney just to make sure that we can get up there safely. Sometimes, I mean, it has happened where I can't even get up to the, to take a look at the chimney because the, the peaks are so um, steep, mm. but just from looking up uh, from the ground, you can tell that it's, it's visible that the crown needs uh, major repair. You ever use, uh, use like a scissor lift or a crane or anything? Yeah. Yes, we have. Um, typically, homes or downtown, we get a lot of calls for these things. And in these areas, there's lines everywhere. Oh, no. Yeah. So it can be very tough right. um, and challenging. Yeah, it's not always so easy. Yeah, sometimes it's like, you know, it would be otherwise a really easy fix, but it's like just getting around everything, getting up there. Yeah, just to, to be safe, it definitely mm. can take more time. For sure. Um, so, how uh, how did you get uh, how did you come into this industry? Like, what made you want to start this? <laughs> My neighbor fooled me oh, when yeah. I was fifteen. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He uh, yeah. My neighbor was a mason. He asked me if I needed some summer work. I was fifteen years old. You know, I think he I think I got paid like nine ten dollars. You know, mm -hmm. back then it was, I was like, I was like a king, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Living like a king. <laughs> so yeah, it was my first job. It's been my only job. I mean, I've had other part-time jobs while going to school, but mm. yeah, it's basically since I was 15, I've been mm, good job. going at it. Um, so, so how long, so how long have you been doing it then? No, 18 years, 18 years. Yeah, oh, okay. 33. Damn. Nice. Yeah. It's I'm 33 too. Um, 88. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah 87. <laughs> close yeah. yeah my brother's brother's age i guess oh okay yeah. well that's um so so you basically were like it, it just kind of grew on you a bit because i'm assuming you tried these other part-time jobs and you're like oh god i'd rather just be well the thing this. i liked about masonry was uh just the satisfaction of seeing my work at the end of the day and i mean i, I like lego i growing mm. up as a kid you know there we go i yeah. like the flintstones <laughs> I, I mean, yeah <laughs> That's when people ask me, what do you do? And I tell them I'm a Mason and they just, you know, they're like, what's that? I just tell them I'm Fred Flintstone, <laughs> modern day Fred Flintstone. That's what I do. Yeah, I'm nice. Um, so there's a, there's a group of you too. So you work with your bro. Yeah, there's uh, my brother. There's uh, another Mason, Andrew. We got uh, a labor, a really good labor. He's a really young guy. Uh, we call hmm. him Young Blood. He's just turned 18. Oh yeah, and uh, an older guy that works with us, Jimmy. Awesome. Sorry, are you looking to bring in more like young people to do the work? Uh, you know, it's I can't even count how many I've gone through mm. um, just to get a decent one, and I feel very fortunate and lucky because um, Alex applied to work with us, and he just I don't see too many young people showing initiative. Mm -hmm. You know, he's already enrolled for school. He went, uh, he asked me if I, he could go to school. And, you know, I wasn't even looking for uh, another uh, apprentice. But since showing the initiative, I was like, yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Just go and get your blue book. Go and go get it done. 
I thought it would be months. He came back the next week, hmm. signed all his papers. I'm, you know. Nice. So I was really happy to see that and uh, want to help him as much as I can. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, hey, man, uh, we got we to gotta do it because like, I think there's a labor shortage going on right now, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, uh, oh, yeah, especially for qualified Masons. I mean, there's uh, there's not a lot of us, but that, mm. I think that's the most rewarding part of owning a company is being able to give back to the community, you know, in the way of putting people through school, um, giving giving them an opportunity to learn a new skill. Right. Yeah, that's a good way to get back to the community. Um, it just seems like it's just hard to find people that are actually just diligent and just that are legitimately invested in just doing the job well, you know? It, it doesn't, I don't, uh, you know, I tell the young guys, it doesn't take much. Show up on time, show up sober, work on honest eight hours, and you'll go far. Yeah, totally. You know, um, is there a lot of uh, addiction in your trade as well? Yeah, you know, we're fortunate not in our crew. Uh, none of us smoke, mm. surprisingly. Hmm. I know, and <laughs> you don't know how many compliments we get on that. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, there's definitely, you know, I find that, uh, so I've been in masonry for a long, long time. I started out during the boom. And during the boom, I mean, we would get some odd characters. Sure. Like, you know, we would get one at, in the morning, he'd be gone by 10, you get somebody else at noon, they'd be gone by 2. Hmm. It was crazy. So I feel like back then it did attract a lot of addiction hmm. and sketchy people. Well, they, they kind of had to, right? You know, it's like beggars couldn't be choosers back then, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, now I feel like um, we've gone through a couple of recessions and uh, it seems like, well, it seems like to me that... Uh, masonry wasn't affected too much i mean it weed out some of the people that uh i guess weren't in it for the long haul mm -hmm. um right well a strong survive you know? yeah that's right how about how about you guys you guys get a lot of characters in roofing uh well we filter them out i think we're uh one of the only companies in town that actually you know drug tests our our guys um I, I mean, I hope that's a, a trend that we start, and I hope people are hearing this, or my competitors are hearing this, and start doing it too, because um, it's going to help increase their safety and you know the overall. Safety's a huge concern. Yeah, for, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Like, um, but I mean, uh, you know, yeah, we filter these people out, but we there, there's a lot of them. You know, we had a guy um, not too long ago. He came in, and you know, you don't want to judge a person by the way they look. You know, sometimes, but it's like you kind of look at them, you're like, and you see what they drive, and you're just like, oh god, you just want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but it's like here's this cup, <laughs> you know what, let's see what you got. And yeah, this one guy was like, he, like, I mean, I wanted to give him a shot, like, but he failed for meth. Yeah. So I was like, dude, uh, I mean, I, tough. yeah. And I basically, he's like, well, how can I work for you again? And I was like, well, I tried to throw it other. I, I kind of knew this wasn't going to happen. I was like, you got to pass two. You got to go to, I told him you got to go to a lab and you got to pass two, uh, two weeks across from each other. So I wanted him to do two. And I was going to pay for his test too and everything, but, uh, he didn't. And I'm, kind of glad he didn't because i didn't want to deal yeah. with that crap you know especially when you're at that high up yeah oh and it's, i mean not just that but it's like, you know like are they casing out the house are they looking around to are they going to steal stuff from me you know like you know because once they get um to that point they'll do anything to, for their next hit you know you know that's true and you know that's uh quite an ugly drug that one yeah yeah that's a, that's a big problem out there but yeah i mean just this industry in general i just notice a lot of unprofessionalism and things and if you just be a little bit more professional and um just do your job well it's you're gonna be a success i mean yeah, definitely yeah because again most people just want to be an astronaut nobody wants to be a roofer you know nobody wants to be amazing these days you know like and, what are you hey. talking about mike i got straight a's in school <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> so i'm a bricklayer <laughs> yeah man uh, how far did you get through school I uh, graduated. I went to Mount Royal. Uh, did a few years of business. Oh, yeah. Uh, went to SAIT. Did my uh, trade there. I ended up teaching a semester in SAIT. Oh, no way. Yeah. Mm. Um, right after I finished, uh, the the teacher there had a severe heart attack. Hmm. Unfortunately, he's okay. Oh, um, good. But he couldn't be under any 
stress and i guess it happened on like a thursday and class was on monday mm. so they were kind of scrambling um he threw out uh our names and uh they gave us a call like you know i kind of just chuckled and said yeah okay okay like this is a joke right and, <laughs> you know and uh then they called me they called me on friday they called me on saturday hmm. and they called me on sunday and on sunday i said okay i'll go for coffee and uh because they told me they didn't asked everybody else i was like there's got to be a hundred other guys you know they said they called everybody mm -hmm. nobody wants to do it if you don't you know if we don't have somebody to do it we're gonna have to cancel mm -hmm. second year and mm -hmm. i know what that means wow. to guys so uh that's desperate it, it means a lot so wow. i didn't want that to happen you know i don't like standing in mm -hmm. front of people and talking all day and you know i mean teaching is uh it's a whole nother animal on its own uh, yeah. especially in a classroom you know all eyes on you the whole time but uh you know, we we did it and learned a lot from it, grew a lot from it, and uh, I'm glad I did. It was a cool experience, and yeah, no regrets there. Made a, met a lot of good connections. It's like it's almost like it reminds me of like a superhero movie, you know, you know that like retired or renegade cop, you know, and it's like, no man, I'm retired. It's like, come on, we gotta <laughs> do this. Do it for the kids, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, uh, they, you know. They, uh, so the original, the guy that wrote the curriculum, his name was Gint and they brought him back to kind of mentor us. So it was a good chance cause I got to meet him and, uh, you know, uh, learn from him. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like putting the old dog with the, with the new pup. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think that both can teach each other. I mean, I know there's a lot of old school guys that, um, I give some lessons too because there's a, uh, you know, they upgrade, they update things and some people aren't keeping up, but then they can teach me their old school, like, you know, some of their tricks, you know, you know, and, um, well, that's one thing about stone masonry, full bed masonry. It literally takes years, almost a lifetime to master. I mean, mm. I, we've been on projects where we could be on that house for up to a year, hmm. just doing a certain style of stone and then the next year you do another style of stone so it's a whole new learning curve so to get that learning curve down it literally takes a long time i feel like it's um it's a long time it's mason. almost like mason or not amazing it's almost like um framing you know like uh framing it's like yeah i'm a framer but it's like how good can you like can you do a spiral staircase that goes 20 floors up you know you know like i mean it's just there's such a learning curve and i i see like with masonry that's such a huge topic like what are you doing like you could be doing anything you could be doing roads you could be doing fences you could be doing tile in a shower you know like archways anything archways yeah um so so, so you're saying i mean uh, so how's the learning curve for you so how where do you feel like you're at with, uh, in terms of skill um well always learning i mean it's funny how i'm just on the topic of teaching, learning uh, from the old guys and the old guys learning from new guys. A lot of times uh, we'll go and work on a you know, certain style of stone that I haven't worked on in years. Literally it could be like five, seven years I haven't touched this stuff. We go get a job contract for it and it's almost like I'm reteaching myself by teaching the guys mm. you know, what to do, what to look for. You know, I f often find myself, uh, you know, the first day I'll give everyone a rundown of what to do. I'll go home and then I'll just start remembering all these certain tricks and rules and things you can do to uh, move a lot faster. Gotcha. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of outside of what we do. I mean, we, we got a couple specialty products, but uh, in terms of, um, you know, like sloped roofing, it's usually pretty standard. Uh, I think masonry is a, definitely a, a lot more to it than... Oh, yeah. I mean, even um, just listening how the chisel sounds when you're trying to split stone. I mean, mm. it's a very distinct sound that you got to try to hear for. Hmm. You also got to read the rock. Oh, yeah. You know, if there's <laughs> um, stress points in the rock, you're going to have a tough time. Hmm. So you almost got to look for the grains and wor work with the grains. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Hey, I, I can believe it. You know, what? there's so many things I want to do. I mean, that's something I would like to know how to do. So like... Uh, if you were building a house, what kind of siding would you want? Siding, uh, I think I would do probably stone bottom brick top. Hmm. So 
first floor stone, everything above brick. Okay. So more like very European style. Mm. Uh, so how many layers of brick would you do? Just one. Just one, yeah. Now, are we talking about f- like a load-bearing wall? Um, I don't know. I just think maybe like, as, I don't know if you did do like three three or if you just do the one. Yeah. I mean, you can if you're doing load-bearing or mm-hmm. if you're trying to um, just get a little bit better R value in your house. Um, mm. Typically, that's used for... So back in the day, wood wasn't so accessible, but stone was, especially uh, to build a wall. Mm. So that's why it was so easy to build your foundation out of uh, stone. You would build it typically a couple feet wide or the, at least the houses in Europe. You know, um, you've been to Europe a few times. Uh, I love checking out the masonry and how they did things. I bet. And one thing that I noticed was all the houses, the foundations are masonry. Hmm. They're all about two to three foot wide, depending on how tall the house is above it. And above that, it's typically brick or wood. Okay. Um, and those those buildings have been up for a long time. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so when it comes to brick, like you, so you say you just do one layer around your house. I mean, I think brick is an amazing idea, especially for our climate. I mean, with the hail and all that. Um, fire rating, all that stuff. Uh, so, like, is there a specific kind of brick that you would go for? Um, well, I we really like to use the Shaw Brick products out of Halifax. Um, well, for one, their their bricks are awesome to work with. They absorb moisture really well, mm-hmm. as well as we've noticed that you know other manufacturers um, their bricks can be a little bit bowed and bananaed. Mm. So uh, we noticed that they take a little bit more time on their mold. And uh, so their bricks are a little bit crisper, a little bit straighter. And also they're Canadian. I mean, hmm. I don't know how about you guys, but uh, lately getting material, anything from the States has really been difficult. Yeah. And, no, we're getting the same. That you problem. know, earlier this year, we were looking at six to eight weeks. Now we're looking at 10 to 12 weeks wait hmm. on material, which is... Uh, you know, I'm 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 only guessing it's gonna get uh, maybe a little bit worse before it gets better. Mm. So if you're looking, uh, if you're thinking about doing, you know, your roof or some masonry, I would highly recommend you even just get the quote now, get the ball rolling because uh, you might ha- you might be surprised on how long you have to wait to get material. Yeah, that's excellent advice. Yeah, especially for something specialty products. You know, with our uh, manufacturers. Uh, like basically all across the board, like even uh, Canadian manufacturers having a problem um, just getting the, you know, certain colors are now out. So, but. yeah, well, that uh, that hailstorm didn't help. No, last year. no, it didn't. Um, and I mean, we surely didn't need that hailstorm. I'm not happy about it, um, but it was, uh, yeah, it's definitely drained a lot of our, our resources here. So, um, OK, well, uh, how about this uh, photo we got here? So who are these? Uh, well, on the left, that handsome fella is the the owner, me, uh, Will. <laughs> the guy on the far right, that's my brother Miguel, and the guy in the center is the guy that made the sign. Oh, okay. so without him, that picture would not be possible. Nice. And wh- where'd you put that sign? Uh, we put it. Uh, we made a frame, mm-hmm. and then we laid some rundle stone behind it. And right now, it's currently sitting on one of the buildings we just finished on Edmonton Trail and Twentieth Northeast. Hmm. Cool. And um, so Miguel, he's your younger brother? Actually, no, he's my older brother. Older brother, okay. Yeah, actually, he's uh, 10 and a half months older than me, my oh, poor okay. mother. Wow. <laughs> She's just like, let's just get this done. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. So you're... Um... Yeah, I... Oh. You know, my brother came into the trade about... Uh, I think it's about five, five or seven years ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Nice. No looking back. Yeah, yeah, no. He mm-hmm. didn't work for me then, though. I mean, mm-hmm. I couldn't teach him, you know. I don't know if you have brothers or sisters, but I think I fired him for sweeping the wrong way once. Oh, yeah. You know, so it's just, <laughs> it's very tough, especially showing him. But he, you know, I one of my best friends owns another masonry company, and 
he went and, uh, you know, I said, hey, can you give him a job? He said, sure. He went and learned with him. Unfortunately, he passed away in a, a fatal car accident oh. a few years ago. Mm. So, I mean, you know, um, I just said, hey, come on over, work with us. And hmm. been working together ever since. That's awesome. Well, it's, um, he's sweeping the right way now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the right direction. <laughs> Hey, Mike, why don't you pass one of those olives over here? I need oh, to yeah, see what this one. is all there's about. There's only one more oh, Only one. I'm glad I, uh, yeah. I'm glad <laughs> I asked when I did. All right, let's see what the hype's all about. That almond oh, in the middle so is good. next level. Oh, oh I, I know. Hate, I hate olives, but this is delicious. Yeah, right? <laughs> I do, yeah. <laughs> I know. I was like, I, I don't eat olives, but, like, Angela's got me on them. Got um, me on them now, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's move uh, the slide over here, and we'll... See what else we got going on. Just want to give us a little flip. Okay, so what uh, what do we got going on here? So here we have a chimney that needs a little bit of uh, repointing done. Um, there's a tree right above it, um, which casts a lot of debris. Um, there's a little bit of cracks on the crown that are really too concerning. Not too concerning? No, not at all. Cause I mean, typically you will get that, that will happen as well as these were wood burning, mm. uh, fireplaces. And I do believe the homeowner changed them out for a gas insert. So it's just a gas pipe sticking up all the way through the flue. Mm -hmm. So, um, that flue is no longer going to, um, contract and expand because it's not going to get that same heat um so it's i mean typically when you have your you know for homeowners uh one of the main things that you got to look out for for your flu your flu is that clay looking piece of thing sticking out at the very top of your crown mm. there needs to be a little bit of separation between that and your concrete pour so that the flu has room to flex Typically, when masons don't do this or they forget this step, they pour it right onto the flue. The flue will expand and contract, you know, with the heat, therefore leading to cracking on the crown. As you can see, it's cracked That's right there. That's what's happened. Okay, so there's got to be a little gap. Yeah, a little bit of, a little bit of give. So uh, what can I, I mean, if a homeowner wanted to DIY this, uh, I mean, even for me, I'm actually kind of asking because, I mean, I don't know actually like the professional way to fix this. Cause I, I get this sometimes. I like, say, yeah, there's this crack there. Do something about it. Like... What do you, what, what's a quick thing you can do just to make, just prevent that from getting worse? Um, what I would do is I would first clean off the area. Um, then I would go get a little bit of thin set, uh, mix it fairly wet, uh, just so it can seep into the crack as much as oh, possible. Okay. Um, you do that. And then the next day you come back, you kind of sand that all down. And then I would glue wash the whole cap. So you would get um, masonry adhesives. Um, mm. You would give that a, the top a glue wash. And then I would um, parge another layer over everything um, just so it gets a good bond. That's why we use the glue. And then that's how you can reseal your cap. You might have to do that twice. But, uh, I mean, typically with by doing these steps, you can make your chimney you know we'll say give it another 10 years so hard to say depending on i know yeah for i i got you on that one um okay so so uh so if somebody's putting caulking in there it's probably a bad idea then yeah i wouldn't necessarily go with caulking i mean if you want to to use caulking you can you can use um you can use a little bit of caulking where the flu meets the so i would when you go to pour it typically would use a piece of ram board or something to separate the, the pour from the flue. You come back the next day, you pull that out. Then, then right in between there, you would fill that with a caulking just so water doesn't seep in. Right. And it's that uh, gives it flexible. The, right. The flexible. Okay. Well, good little lesson there. Nice. Yeah. That is quite a procedure though. Even it's uh, not a small fix. Uh, it sure it isn't. And yeah. the number one thing about chimneys is safety. Mm. Yeah, for sure. No safety is at the, the top of the triangle um what do we uh, got going on here so 
here, um, I believe the the um, the snow and the elements come from this side of the chimney. Um, this chimney goes to a 45. I believe it's a 45 angle. So instead of buying, um, you know, bricks with that angle, it can be cost. It could cost a lot. So what they'll do is they'll put a return and then cut it off at the one brick and then uh, angle the cut from there just to save on material. Um, so this is just an exposed edge. It's been exposed over the years. Probably hasn't been touched since, since it's been laid. Um, I think this house was built in the 30s. Mm. So it's been quite some time. So uh, it's an old house. This is not an easy fix then. Like this is, it you know, takes some time. Actually, surprisingly, because the cap was so well laid, it is an easy fix. Mm. So the brick, uh, one thing that we check for is the integrity of the masonry unit. If nothing, if the masonry unit integrity is still intact, all we have to do here is do a little bit of uh, cleanup work and regrouting. Mm. Once we're done regrouting, um, you won't have any problems there for at least, you know, mm. a good 10, 20 years at least. Nice. Okay. That's a good permanent solution. Uh, so what do you think a homeowner should budget in for a job like this? Um, honestly, it would depend, again, on scaffold setup. Mm. I mean, if this was, a, let's say, a bungalow, I can get up there with a step ladder. The pitch is fairly easy to work with. So for something like this, a service call, we would probably do six fifty. Six fifty, okay. Yeah, it doesn't break the bank. No, it yep. sure doesn't. And I mean, this one I think is uh, quite up there. It's it's pretty high up there. Hmm. So something like this, uh, I I do believe this one is nine fifty. Okay. And that's just because uh, accessibility, the scaffold setup, and we're gonna have to be uh, harnessed off to get the backside. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. It looks like that tree's in the way there too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then, um, kind of the same deal here. Yep. So this, uh, chimney is like a triangle. If you think, mm -hmm. you know, envision it that way, we were just taking a look at the other side of the triangle. This is the, you know, the opposite side. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I do believe you can see right through to the core of the chimney. So here are the gaps, it's eroded a little bit more. Um, but, you know, looking at the integrity of the brick, it's still intact. So, you know, um, hmm. I think the homeowner got to this just in time. So the big problem is when you have to change the masonry unit for a few reasons. One, you're going to have to mess with the crown. You never want to mess with the crown. If you don't have to, it'll just keep on adding costs to the mm. job. Um, two, for an old house like this, you will, ne well, I shouldn't say never. It'll be very difficult to find the matching brick. That's one thing mm. people don't understand. You'll, I mean, maybe if somebody knocked down the house around your neighborhood and for some reason kept the brick. But to find matching brick, it's extremely, extremely difficult. Yeah, I can imagine. And uh, it, it kind of looks like the uh, uh, the homeowner tried a little DIY on there, hey? Yeah, I, I do believe he um, he said he put some sort of caulking. He made a mess. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. obviously it didn't work because he's got a leak inside his house now. Yeah, that's the, that's the interesting thing that people don't know. And they, I see this on the roof too, like... A homeowner go up there and i mean i don't blame a homeowner for trying this you know you got yeah. a leaky chimney you want to go up there you want to cock it makes sense but it's like okay now i gotta go there and i gotta get all this cocking out so you just basically doubled the cost because the fix didn't work you know yeah oh, so yeah. that's yeah so it's, sometimes the homeowner just needs to realize that just don't do it let somebody yeah. else take care of it i mean i i mean one of my best stories i mean for me doing this is like i had a, I had a bathtub that i need to refinish and i got the bathtub kit from home depot and I did all this work and I exposed myself to all these toxic chemicals and the the finish went to absolute crap. And then the guy that came to actually do it professionally then billed me like over twice as much to undo like this, all this goop that I got like everywhere. It was like, so I'm, I'm not getting in the bathtub finishing game. That's for sure. I'm, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you got to watch out for that. Um, okay, let's move along.
This is one I went to go check out yesterday. Um, the chimney has started to separate from the house. Oh, I've seen this before. Yeah. You know, I've seen this before, not to this scale. Hmm. Typically, it'll be like, you know, an inch, maybe. Oh, man. Maybe a half inch, you know, a couple inches at top. But at, at the roof there, at the very top, we're almost looking at four or five inches. Wow. Yeah. So. Um, it's a safety hazard. It point. is a safety hazard. Now, what the previous homeowner did, the block underneath that brick, um, something's happened to it. It's kind of hard to tell because what he did was parged over everything mm. and then just jointed in lines to make it look like the block is there. Wow. So it's <laughs> so hard to tell what's going on Man. because it's kind of been covered up. Yeah. Holy. So now this... this um, this whole thing's got to come down. Really? Okay. Done. Yeah, I mean, wow. so that's huge renovation. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it is. Yeah. I mean, it unfortunately is. Hmm. Okay. And um, so what what disqualifies it at this point in time? Like, what's like, what is the the death blow to this thing that's making you have to take it down? Um. So typically, my concern is um. The homeowner said it's been like he's been there for 10 years. Um, it has gotten a little bit worse, you know, to how much I don't really know. He just said he it has gotten worse over the years. Hmm. So it is moving uh, typically, you know, and uh, it's a rental unit. So I could not go downstairs to see what's going on. But he did say the fireplace goes all the way downstairs. So. I'm guessing, well, my guesses are here, um, typically the core of this fireplace is laid on the uh, foundation of the house, and the shell that we're seeing that's separating from the house, um, you would pour another foundation for it, and that foundation probably has failed. Mm. So that's why we're getting this. Um, you know, sometimes in a small chimney, he might be able to jack it up, you know, but not this. Do not recommend it. Really? Um, okay. So, so like with this one, are you able to reuse any of the supplies? I mean, we sure can. Would the homeowner want us to pay for to demo it and clean it? Probably not. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of those things that it's very unfortunate, but. Uh, I, I do believe this whole thing needs to come down and uh, he's trying to save the inside. Mm. Um, so when you lay your core, you put wall ties in all your block, then your wall ties is what attaches your outside shell. You know, it gives it lateral support. Gotcha. So the bottom has failed. The mm. ties are obviously doing their thing because they're now pulling the shell with it. Mm. Create more damage. That's right. Um, how would you take this thing down from the top down? Yeah. Just like just bang it out with like mallets or what? Uh, jackhammer, um, something like this chimney's pretty basic. Uh, it wouldn't be too hard. Um, we'll just do it. We'll brace it up at the bottom and then, uh, we'll start from the top down. Um, won't take too long, like probably a day or two. Okay. Knock this thing down. And then build it back up. How much is that going to take? Uh, well, um, I gave him a quote. I don't know if he's going to go for it because to me it sounds like a rental property. Mm. So that's one of my biggest questions when I go to an, uh, to meet a client to talk, discuss a project. I say, what are your goals? What is your goal? You know, is this your forever home? Is this a rental property? Are you trying to sell it? That'll help determine what's the best route of action you know to take so something like this uh he told me it's a rental property um he wants to keep it as cost effective as possible you know i told him well we can demo it for you um he was asking me if he can just put plywood or something and go flush with the house you can't because of the fireplaces inside mm -hmm. you know we're gonna do our best to try to save the fireplaces inside but uh you know, that's going to be a challenge. Hmm. Yeah. So we're going to have to demo it. Anything that uh, kind of comes down in the process will relay. And then here, he'll probably have to frame it out. Metal, metal framing, 
dura rock because plywood's mm-hmm. you know not the cheapest right now right yeah and it's... Then, uh i would stucco it i mean you, you guys do stucco uh we don't no okay. no no yeah. we don't but we have a company we work with desi's uh stucco and stone okay yeah they're a great stucco company that's who i recommend mm. Awesome. Well, um, you know, to me, this looks like, you know, it's almost like you're taking a limb off and you're trying to, like, save the body, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, it's just such a liability. It's such a huge liability. Because that, you know, that could potentially also do damage to his neighbor's house. Hmm. Right. Oh, yeah. No, we, we deal with that all the time with roofs. Or like, we can damage just the, the homeowner's house. Well, yeah, that's... A, you know, our, uh, I, I've gotten, um, we were doing a house out in Pritis and the chimney needed to come down. Now the homeowner, we gave him a quote. He's like, no, I'll do it myself. Oh boy. And you know, um, he cut the bottom of the chimney. Um, and then he just tried to push it over and the, the chimney came down, you know, did damage to the roof. Oh no. Yeah. So. Yeah, ended no, up no, causing him a whole lot more. Oh, wow. Yeah, I that's what I, I mean. So I say I've, I've seen it. I see it all the time. I mean, unless you don't, like, you can't do stuff if you don't know what you're doing. You know. No. Just do what you're good at. I just recently <laughs> changed a floorboard in my kitchen the other day. I just DIY'd it after watching some YouTube videos, and it wasn't the smoothest job, but I know a little more now than I did before. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> A little more respect for that trade now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was it was um it was a pain. It was like a tongue and groove type of floorboard, and it's you know removing a piece in it was like maybe this long the sing- the single board. So it was a uh, it was difficult, and you definitely undermined the kind of patience and dexterity it takes to not damage mm-hmm. the surrounding boards and yada yada yada. So yeah, well, trying to mm-hmm. do things yourself can easily result in more damage. And it, and it usually doesn't look as like easy as you know you, you take a look at a professional dude on youtube and it's like oh that's easy but it's yeah. like you know you, you got to have like the muscle memory you know it almost seems like it's, yeah. it's weird how you start to do it and then you you ask yourself well why doesn't mine look like his <laughs> yeah. yeah no that's so true um you know that that's one good like um so that, that's one thing i like to how i like to teach guys is uh you can learn everything about masonry you can read it all through textbooks but once you start to actually do the trade it's a skill right so it being a skill you just need to practice there is no i mean really way to study it you just gotta it's just trial and trial and error sure i i mean i think i, I think there's both sides of it because i know a lot of roofers out there that have never put a like never read the packaging uh, of the shingle that they're putting on and it's like their spaces are all wrong and stuff like that so i mean there's like there's definitely the technical information you need to know but i mean the hands-on is definitely like i think they kind of they kind of go hand in hand in a way you know yeah definitely yeah yeah um but i mean i guess if we want to go back to our ancestors there was no manual just kind of <laughs> had to really do it yeah but yeah no for sure i mean i agree you can't just read a book and then be like i'm a roofer now or i'm amazing now it doesn't, doesn't work like that <laughs> Um, okay, well, let's move along here to your next slide. I think we got another one here, too. Okay, it's just uh, kind of the other side of it. Yeah, I believe so. Oh, oh it's the same oh, side. Double. We got a double take. All right, now we're talking. Some interesting stuff here. Yeah, um, so I know it's a little bit tough to see here, but um, so we are putting stone over an existing wood burning fireplace okay um and why i wanted to show this picture i don't know it'd be a little bit tough to zoom in but can you see where the roof line meets the the chimney i can see that yeah let's see if i can i don't know if i can zoom in on it yeah the zoom feature on this thing is not amazing well up at the top there if you can see it now what we've done is uh We've put a little diverter um, just where that roof line is. On that side, it's not so bad because the slope continues. Mm -hmm. But on the opposite side, it is needed. So this is typically a big problem whenever you get... So the other chimney that we've seen, the roof, it goes through the center. 
it goes right through the roof so right here you see how that one backside goes all the way up continuous yep there's no break now the other one there was a break um on this one it goes all the way up and what we got to worry about here is uh where the water runs off and meets the stone since the stone it can be porous it'll just soak mm -hmm. up water which can lead to damage uh down the road so one of the major issues that we've been noticing is uh no one's putting diverters so that's the biggest thing i said literally it's... yeah and then and then good luck you know if somebody I, I even see stone chimneys like this going in and they don't put the diverters in and then it's leaking it's like well what do you do now you know like you gotta like it's a big deal take that off again so you better make sure it's done properly the first time oh yeah yeah no i i get you there man yeah those diverters get them in there make them big don't go stingy especially if you have a you know a multi-pitch roof where you know let's say the inside corner is uh right on the chimney i mean you're gonna need a pretty big diverter there you know water's gonna sit there um just another area to, to kick it out yeah get it off there and around so in this picture it's uh one of the same issues um you know going from stone on roof to stone on deck on your deck the water is going to run off and you're going to have the same issue as a roof so right, right here um this guy we've been telling him to put diverters if you can go uh, zoom in on this post right here to the left. I, can, I have no flexibility on this darn thing. Okay, no worries. Now, I don't know if you could notice, but the post the post on the that's right in front of that propane tank, that's half high. If okay. You, if you look at the bottom, you see how uh, you can't really tell the joints. Now, if you look at the post on the to the left of it, the joints are white. White. They're they're like uh, highlighting the stone. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. Um, so that is due to water runoff. Mm, oh yeah. So there's no diverters where that deck meets the stone. So typically, what'll happen is it'll run onto the stone and run all the way down the face. It'll pull the uh, uh, pull the uh, fluorescence out of the mortar. That's why the mortar joints turn white so, so what's the problem here is uh is it just two different trades working together is that kind of what's going on here um the problem here is um yeah i think it's just uh trades not talking to each other i mean i've you know i i i've told i've done many posts like this and i'll actually make the customer sign something that i'm not liable if you do not put these diverters in, I'm not liable for anything because I know, I know we're going to have to come back here down the road. Yeah. No, that's and, a good idea. You know, those diverters are like, they're a huge issue, man. I know. And so under or overlooked. Yeah. I don't get it. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. I see it all the time in, um, you know, basically any penetration you have that's has to have diverters. I mean, you know, um, we see it all, all the time with skylights. It's mm -hmm. like, man, take you two seconds to put in a diverter, but okay. <laughs> but all right, okay, well. Okay, so you got some uh, brick going over existing here. Yeah, so this is that same one we were just looking at two slides ago, I believe. Man, that thing's going to be bomb-proof. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, so again, the crown, perfectly intact. This was a really... Um, you know, chimney well done, job well done. Um, the homeowner just wanted a makeover. Mm. I like that stone style. Yeah, it's uh, that I believe is uh, natural lead stone from Aspen Brick and Stone Supply. Mm. Very popular. Mm. Yeah. I oh. think this stuff's from, Mon no, it's from mm. BC. Mm. Well, it, you know, it beats the hell out of that parging. I don't, I mean, I mean, parging is obviously cheap, but I like the, the look of that way more than just that. Yeah, definitely. Harsh. And, you know, to all homeowners that uh, want to maybe do a little facelift to your house and think that you need to demo the brick to put stone up that, uh, you know, you absolutely don't have to do that. As you can see, this is a thin brick. Uh, sorry, this is a natural thin veneer stone. So 
um, there's no compressive force. There's just it adheres to the wall. So if you're thinking about changing uh, the look of your house and you have some brick, uh, just know that you can put stone right over it. So when, when you're going around those windows there, you're going to have to adjust those windows, right? Yeah, so those windows, um, I do believe, come pop out um, an inch and a half hmm. so that our flats run in and butt in to the framing of the windows. Mm. Right. Yeah. You also need a drip edge above that too, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Ab above it, yeah, we there's flashing there, and then below it, we put sills. Okay, cool. Okay, and that's all of the uh, the slides that we got there. So that's pretty uh, pretty informative stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, we definitely uh, anytime I come across these kind of chimneys, I always refer you guys. Um, I mean, we do chimneys, but chimneys is not for every. Like, it's just it's it's a pretty wide topic too. You know, sometimes there's a vinyl chimney. You know, we can deal with that, no problem. You know, um, but those stone chimneys, no, we're, you guys are our guys for that. Yeah, we appreciate it. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys being there for us and helping our clients out. So, uh, so I mean, outside of uh, all this, what do you like to do for hobbies? Um, for hobbies, I like to do martial arts. I've been doing martial arts my whole life. Oh, cool. I actually started, I started martial arts the same time I started masonry. Oh, hmm. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and uh, why do you like to do martial arts? Like, what keeps you going? Uh, why I like martial arts is because it's uh, just so honest and truthful. Hmm. I mean, um, you can't lie in it. Um, and I just love it because it, uh, you know, it's, I feel like it's tough for people to live in the moment. Hmm. And one thing that I like about martial arts or fighting. I guess when you're fighting someone, you're just so in the moment. You're not worried about, you know, did I leave my oven on? Am mm. I going to be able to pay my electricity bill? You're just worried about, you know, what's in front of you. And I think just being able to live in the moment is uh, something we all need to do mm. a little bit more often. In tune with it uh, all. And, and so do you follow UFC at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I, I'm i always watching the fights. Mm. Yeah, I, there's... Uh, there's uh, Hakeem Dawadu. He trains out of uh, the gym that I, that I go to. I oh, think yeah. he's currently ranked 15th in the welterweight division. Oh, decent. Yeah, he's got yeah. a fight coming up in June. Hmm. Well, should be a good one. Yeah, is he, so you train with him at all a little bit? or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We train together every now wow. and then. It's nice. Um, I was watching, I think the last UFC I watched, it was like a title fight or something like that. There's this one girl, I don't know their names, so I'm not like into it too much, but uh, I mean, I'm, I'm into it, but not like that into it. But uh, this one girl, she's just dominating right now. And I couldn't even believe the fight they, they set her up with. She just demoed this other lady and like, like she was like this late, they put a girl in there in the ring with her that was scared of her. Like, oh, was, yeah. like it's like, they should have just canceled the fight, man. I don't know. But yeah, I don't know if you don't know the one I'm talking about then, hey? How long ago super was sad. it? I don't know. It was like maybe like three months ago or something. Three Not... months. Probably Amanda Nunez versus some poor helpless victim. That was it. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what I think. Was, yeah. Oh, man, she got smoked. I recommend watching it again because it was like, I thought it was an embarrassment. I was like. Oh. You know what? Actually, I've trained with Amanda down in Miami. Oh. Um, yeah, my brother and, well, my uh, stepbrother is getting married. Mm. Um, so I was part of the. A wedding party I went down there uh for a couple of weeks while i was down there i wanted to find the gym to train at because i was actively fighting um back at that time oh cool and uh went down to mma masters where she was training at the time and uh yeah put some rounds in with her and her her, her wife uh, nina oh, okay great great people hmm. and uh yeah loved it there interesting that's kind of cool you're in the scene a little bit yeah yeah i fought a handful of times oh yeah yeah um how how was your win ratio how'd you do um amateur not so well, i did okay amateur but i i did a lot better when i when i fought professionally oh cool yeah, i didn't have too many pro professional fights just two but uh i won them both hmm, nice good yeah. job um what stopped you from continuing 
<sighs> what stopped me from continuing was uh, I started my business. Mm. And my last fight, I was doing the business, still training six days a week. Mm. And it was just a lot. Mm. Um, you know, I had to put focus into one. I love fighting, but it doesn't pay the bills. Mm. So I kind of chose to put some time and effort into uh, masonry and started my company. But I'm still, you know, very active and training Mm. and uh, I still teach a lot out at the gym. Whenever it opens, I'll go back to teaching. Nice. Yeah, that's a... So it's, I mean, that's kind of an interest of mine too. I just, it's, uh, I just have trouble getting out there and doing it. Um, you should come out, come yeah. check it out. Come to teach over at Champions Creed. Um, you know, hopefully we can be open by July. I think they were saying. They're saying July, yeah. July, yeah. Well, Some, something to look forward to. Hey, yeah. Let me know. Looking forward to the gyms opening up. I just kind of got my first membership. I think just a month or so before they shut all that down. Hmm. Carly's very oh, active man, there as well. It's, 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 yeah, it's brutal because I was starting to get out. I was waking up at 5.30 a.m. I was at the gym. I was home. I still had time to get ready for work, blah, blah, blah. Kind of moving into that healthier lifestyle, mm. I suppose. Getting yeah, in then, the groove of it. Yeah, I, just, I was feeling it. It was feeling really good. I was, you and know. Getting in the groove is the hardest part. Yeah, it was rough. Well, Carly, she's a gym rat, so like she's dragging my ass yeah, out she's of bed been all the seen, time and seen some of her tiktoks and then hard. everything closed down and me keeping active since then has been difficult but i am very very excited for them to reopen have, uh, have we got any uh, audience questions or anything Does anybody we haven't had anything come in nope no oh, okay nope well if anybody wants to ask anything give it a go um we're gonna uh, so is, is so anything else besides uh, martial arts that you like to to get into I like martial arts, you know, um, I like investing. Oh yeah. I like to invest a lot. Um, stocks, stocks and crypto mainly, Mm. you know, I was big into stocks. I did okay. Um, but I just uh, don't see the same movement as Mm. I see in the crypto market. Although today is a pretty big day for AMC. Anyone out there? Oh, AMC. AMC is killing it. Mm. Really? I don't oh know. yeah, it's gonna be a few uh, overnight millionaires. Oh I think. yeah! Uh, wow, you're you're following it then, hey? Yeah, I'm not in it. Oh, uh, just following it. I know a lot of friends that uh, that are. So it's you know I'm very happy for them. It's very exciting, mm. and I just love seeing you know my friends succeed. And... That's awesome, man. I I, I was a uh, I was following. I've I've been following Bitcoin for a while. I actually. Uh, came pretty close to predicting the top on the Bitcoin. I was off by a month and a half and 10,000 uh, USD. Nice. Yeah. Um, I run a, it's just kind of a side hustle for me too. I mean, I like to do uh, uh, investment advice and things like that. You should check out my page one day. Yeah, I, I definitely will. <laughs> I, sometimes I, uh, you know, it's weird how we, you know, we don't talk about investments or anything like that in school yeah and i'm you know i you know i got into it i was like thinking to myself uh you know all the world's billionaires every single one is an investor yeah so i was like shoot you know i'm young whatever i don't Mm. care if i you know it doesn't Mm. hurt me make or break me if i lose it yeah for oh for for sure um especially when you're into the sub penny stocks sub penny man that's uh that's interesting stuff the penny stocks holy cow i mean you know that's uh that's a heart attack right there i don't th- i don't think it is you know you get the sub penny to- uh sub pennies like we're talking less than a penny uh some of them they're like it's like it's crazy how many decimal points they're over but they have like high volume a lot of cap going on um you don't put a lot in there you know that's the thing you know you, you put 500 bucks 250 or whatever and see what happens you know oh i'm a big fan of those yeah. oh yeah, yeah i'm a big fan of those i mean <laughs> Me you know i've learned a lot um you know, one of the things that I'm, you know, just reminding myself is even though a company has no fundamentals going kind of nowhere, um, FOMO is real. Oh, yeah. And there's still opportunity to be made. Totally. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, you have the, you know, you could say that the manipulators are in there or whatever, you know, they, they strike a deal and yeah, a bunch of things, you know, they, they have, they'll have, yeah, they'll, they'll be sitting there literally no income and they'll go up like 30, 30 times. You know, like just 
kind of blows your mind. But uh, that's what I always find the interesting thing I find is when people are really bearish on something, it's like it's generally a good time to buy it. When everyone's super bullish, it's like a good time to be like, okay, I don't think so. You yeah. know, that's I'm, I'm a contrarian a little bit that way. But yeah, there's um, there's a really, really um, interesting company, Cielo Waste Management. It's uh, it's an Alberta company. Oh, it's out of all. Well, there's a plant in Alderside. I think that I believe there there's a few other plants. There's building they're building another plant in Edmonton. And what they do is they take your garbage, um, break it down, and turn it into a grade one biodiesel. Mm. So publicly traded? Yeah, publicly traded. I mean, you know, it was an insane run. Really? February, the beginning of February, I think it was at six or eight cents, and at the end of February, it went to a dollar seventy-eight. Wow. I think something like that. I mean. Wow. That was huge. <laughs> awesome. That was huge. Hey. And that's the thing, though. It's like now it's gone, though. It's run, it's gone. It's like now, what do you do? It, it it's come, it's settled down a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, I'm already out. Probably come back in. Um, you know, they're talking about a similar company based out of, uh, I think it was Montana. That company. Let's. I'm just gonna throw out some, you know, numbers that have no base in anything, but just to give you an idea. Um, so X company from the States, you, you know, you give them a million dollars, they'll give you 10 barrels of, uh, of oil or gas or whatever, biodiesel. With Cielo Waste Management, you give them a million dollars, they'll give you 20, you know, barrels of oil or gas or whatever. So the potential is way bigger as well as uh, once this interview came out, um, you've seen a lot of uh, American investors um, hopping up hopping on board hmm. so yeah it's a really really cool company i really like it because uh, again like turning your garbage turning anything into a biodiesel i mean it's great it could be great for the world i mean hmm. it's uh great for this carbon tax i know a lot of people aren't too happy about it could definitely help a lot with that um so for... yeah it's uh um my biggest issue with the carbon tax is that it just doesn't actually go to the environment, you know? It it doesn't make sense. I mean, mm. it's just solely based on income. You mm. can be, uh, you know, let's just say you can love the earth and you can, you know, walk everywhere and you can do everything that you can to be green, but it's only based on your income. Yeah. So, just, I mean, it don't make sense. That's so true. I didn't look at it that way. Um, no, it's, uh, um, yeah, like... And and then and then again the funds just go into the general tax funds and then it goes to Pakistan or something. But um, you know, uh, back to the the biodiesel thing. I, I think that um, this is a theory of mine. But I think that are like our our dumps are going to be like the gold mines of the future. You think so? Literally, yeah. yeah. So you know, I like where you're thinking because <laughs> instead of us paying for our garbage to go to the waste, so they can make um, you know cat like they can make profit on two fronts taking in the garbage from the city instead the city can pay them to take the garbage deal right. with it and then they can sell it um their products from that uh you know breaking down all that garbage turning into a biodiesel cool we'll have to check it out so clo yeah their icon is cmc check cmc them out. cmc all right um okay well let's uh before we wrap this up um what uh, is there anybody you'd like to, to shout out? I know you shouted out a stucco guy. Is there anybody else that you want to mention? Uh, sh I guess the guys over at uh, Aspen Brick and Stone Supply, you know, when it comes to uh, dealing with a material supplier in the city, um, their customer service is through the roof. Uh, very mm -hmm. cordial, professional. Um, you know, if you don't want a headache, I recommend going there. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Um, anybody else at top of mind? Um, other than that, uh, you know, so many great companies that come to mind. Um, but uh, mm, hey, no, no pressure. No pressure. No. Okay. Shout out to uh, No Pain Roofing. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. Uh, okay, cool, man. Well, uh, really great uh, time with you here. Um, would love to have you back one day. You yeah, know. thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely welcome. And um, 
So for, um, yeah, anybody that wants to come on the, the No Pain podcast, you know, give us a call, text anytime. Um, don't forget to get your olives uh, from the Olive Lady. You can follow her on Instagram, um, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, she's, uh, you can get a hold of her at 403-681-1405. You maybe want to hold her stock as a store. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, thanks for joining us all today. And also don't forget to give us a subscribe on YouTube. We really need your help, uh, getting that channel going. Well, bye for now.